Let's go ahead, Ashley. <laughs> no problem. So uh, again, thank you, Senator, for having me. I appreciate being on this esteemed panel of experts. Uh, if I may have to drop off a little early, it was great to have Brandon Coma who can answer all these questions uh, and get everybody straight. And if you have any more questions for me, please uh, know that you can always reach me on Twitter or any social media at, at AshleyBell45, or it, you can reach me at sba.gov um, through the Regional Administrator's Office. And I want to just say that uh, it's important to have these conversations. And I really appreciate Senator Mello's leadership for really extending all of the arms of government uh, to come here to this place, as well as um, the private sector, because this is a partnership is uh, critical to whether or not we're going to succeed. It's a public-private partnership between our lenders, between our business owners, between our churches and our nonprofits. All of us that hold the keys to our culture, everyone who holds the key to the normalcies that we hope to unlock once again. And we begin that by talking today about how do we get access to the capital to restart the engine of the American economy. And this could be no more important than here in Indiana and with uh, Senator Melton and his constituents. That's why I'm here, because he asked and his leadership and, and his light is shining across this country. And those who know him well know that when you get a call from Senator Melton, you show up and you do everything you can to help those that he cares about the most. And that's why I'm here. I want to first talk about SBA in the sense of what is our role? Our role has always been to help out small businesses. Now, because we're in a crisis, we help out more than small businesses. And we have three, two new additional sets of, of entities that we're helping out now. Not only do we help out small businesses defined generally as entities that are under 500 people, we now help out nonprofits and we now help out churches. As of last Saturday, for the first time in the history of SBA, um, the vice president and president decided to open up SBA to faith-based organizations and churches. That has never happened before. So now it's important uh, to let our churches know that everything that I mentioned today is applicable to them. It has never been available before. Our churches that are looking for help and looking for a way of making it through uh, this crisis, through the fact that their, their doors are, are closed because government has asked them to, because for safety reasons. And many of our small churches that don't have the internet capabilities to have service online are suffering greatly. And I think that um, for many of us, the doors of the church have been open our entire lives. And now it's time for us to open our doors to them in their time of need. So how do we do that? We do that by offering them the exact same opportunities that for-profit businesses and other nonprofits are afforded. And so we talk specifically about churches in particular. I want to hone in there because let's talk about eligibility for a church. Generally speaking, our guidelines say that a 501c3 is eligible, but now a church is eligible. And for those people that may have new congregations or new churches, uh, it's important to know that you don't have to have your letter of 501c3 certification in order to, be, in order to qualify as a church. As long as you hold yourself out as a church and you abide by those rules, meaning that you fall within all the do's and don'ts of a 501c3, you still qualify, even though you do not have that certification. That is a major expansion of the, of, of the SBA regulations. So whether you're a new church without a 501c3 letter or a church with one, you still qualify. And this was unequivocal uh, from the president two weeks ago that this will not infringe on any First Amendment rights. There are no uh, additional uh, responsibilities by taking this money. Um, you have the absolute ability to operate as you normally would, uh, whether you're a church, you're a mosque, or synagogue, you still get to operate fully as you normally would without any additional government constraints, which I think is important. And the third section of that, which is important for churches, is uh, we're waiving all affiliation rules. And that means something different to small businesses, but it also applies to churches. If you're a, a business, uh, you're a franchise, uh, then many times with SBA, you have to be listed on our franchise list so you don't get, let's say, for example, you own yeah, a Pizza Hut and you don't want to be a part of the larger Pizza Hut count because that may take you over 500 employees. You just want to be counted as your individual Pizza Hut. Well, that same theory applies many times to our churches that are a part of large denominations, that have bishops, that have superintendents, that have districts, that have conferences. So how do you avoid being counted with the larger group um, uh, with you know, the AME or U UMC churches? Well, all you have to do, if that's a question by your lender, because what's great about this program, your lender makes that call. But if your lender needs to make that decision, 
all you need to do is be able to state that yes, I do receive some funding from a conference or from my larger denomination. However, I do so for religious purposes. If that's to coordinate your religious beliefs, then therefore you are exempt from affiliation rules and those will not count. So this allows all of our small churches that have under 500 employees, which is the vast majority of them, to apply for the loan programs that we're talking about today. The first one is the PPP loan, which is a loan program that I'm sure you've heard of that allows you to take one month's salary, multiply it times 2.5, and come up with an aggregate number that you can have forgiven by the federal government. And in easy sense, uh, to use easy numbers, let's say your salary is, um, you, you, you look at your salary, you, multiple, you add in some expenses, and you get a loan from the bank from a hundred, for $100,000. What $100,000 is the loan you get from the bank. In order for that to be forgivable, $75,000 has to go towards employees. $25,000 has to go towards expenses. If you keep that ratio and you keep everybody employed, that loan is forgivable. On the disaster side, we have a program called IDLE. That's Economic Impact Disaster Loan. It's up to $2 million that has some ability for a cash advance that is forgivable as well. But ideally for this loan, the key for nonprofits is that it is 2.75 interest rate. That's 2.75 interest rate. That's an incredible opportunity for many nonprofits to get working capital. They don't have to pay the loan back until one year from the day of the note, which means your first note, your first payment is deferred for one year. So you get one year to think about how do I grow? How do I maintain uh, not only my level of service, but how do I grow my income? Uh, and that's an incredible tool to use when you talk to your financial advisor, when you're uh, your development teams are strategizing for life after this, which is important to do right now, to not just think about the immediate, but think about what happens next. And I think you have some great uh, experts here to speak after me to help you, uh, offer you advice to figure that out and to, and to make prudent steps to do that. But I think the idle loan is important because the idle loan allows you to get a long-term strategy and the PPP loans allows you to have a short-term strategy. Both of these loans can be used together. Does not mean that you have to pick one or the other. Just use them both wisely. Using them both wisely, they are just what we say they are. They're tools, just tools. Tools to use to build the future that you want to see for your business, for your nonprofit, and for your congregation. And with that, I'll turn it back over to the moderator. All right, thank you, Ashley. I know you have to head out for another series of meetings. Uh, so I just want to thank you in advance. Uh, thank you for serving the country. Thank you uh, just for all your hard work and being a part of this today, it was extremely important that we made sure that folks were well informed with the facts. I know there's a lot of myths uh, floating around on social media about what is real about these dollars of resources. Um, in closing remarks before you, you head out. Yeah. To well, you know, I, I just want to say this. There's a there's a very needs to be a very big sense of urgency. People are going to, you know, talking about will the money run out? Um, we are at two hundred and seventy billion dollars as of last night. There's 349 billion that have been allocated. At the clip we've been going, it was fair to assume that we were close to eclipse the, the program at the end of the week, if not first of next week, without additional congressional interaction, intervention, which could very well happen, but we can't guarantee that. All we know is that we do have funds now and that everyone listening should take advantage. And I've turned over to Mr. Comer and Senator, thank you for your leadership. Uh, I think this is a phenomenal opportunity, most opportune at the at the right time uh, right now for our churches and our nonprofits to take advantage of this. If you need me, if we get more funding, uh, let's continue this conversation. I look forward to it. All right. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That was White House Policy Advisor Ashley Bell, also with the SBA Regional Administration. So thank you, Mr. Bell. Thank you, sir. All right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, like we mentioned before, we have Mr. Brandon Comer, CEO of Comer Capital, that's here, that's going to unpack a little bit more about these uh, tools that Mr. Bell spoke of. So I'll turn it over to you, Brandon. Okay. Thank you, Senator Melton. Uh, and thank you to Ashley for providing an overview of, of these tools that are available to nonprofits and uh, faith-based institutions. And as Ashley said, that is exactly what these are, tools. And so we urge institutions to take a step back you know, and look at this from a holistic you know, point of view. Uh, look at what is requisite for your institution uh, to not only survive during this pandemic, but how can you utilize these programs to position you to thrive afterwards? Uh, and so as it relates to the PPP, you know, if you have W-2 employees, uh, which a lot of churches do, 
uh, you know, whether that's the pastor or, or some other employee, then you certainly want to take advantage of this because it is forgivable, right? And so we certainly want to utilize free funds first. Uh, but in order to receive the forgivability, you have to be able to demonstrate what your payroll, average monthly payroll is. And so whether that's through the filing of payroll tax returns or, um, you know, if you use a payroll provider such as ADP, uh, you need to make sure you have that documentation when you go into your local lender in order to access those funds. Uh, once you calculate the 2.5 times as Ashley mentioned, um, you know, a portion of those funds can be used for uh, the interest expense if you have a mortgage on your facility or a lease expense, uh, as well as utilities uh, or insurance payments. Um, but the key point in order for the loan to be forgiven is that 75% of the loan proceeds have to be used for payroll costs. Uh, as long as you meet that requirement, then the entire amount would be forgiven. So it's important to think there about compliance. You want to make sure that you have all of your payroll records that show during the eight weeks you spent those funds for an eligible purpose so that you can provide that to your lending institution and they can ensure that the loan is forgiven. Now, if for some reason, uh, as an example, if you receive a $100,000 loan, $75,000 that should go towards payroll. If for some reason you spend less than that allowable amount on payroll, then proportionately the amount that you did not spend for an eligible purpose would become a loan and it would be repayable uh, over a two year period of time at a 1% interest rate. So again, it's important to make sure you have those records for compliance purposes. Shifting over to EIDL, uh, the Economic Impact, uh, Injury Disaster Loan, that loan is for a much broader set of working capital purposes. Uh, so any vendor payments, anything that you need to remain operational and do what you do as a nonprofit or a church on a daily basis, you can utilize EIDL funds for that. Uh, it's capped at up to $2 million. And for nonprofits and faith-based institutions, uh, the interest rate is 2.75%. The important factor here is this loan goes directly through the SBA, whereas the PPP, you have to go through, uh, through a lender. And the SBA has relaxed its, its credit standards uh, in order to ensure that more institutions are, uh, can have access to this capital. So a lot of nonprofits and faith-based institutions may not have relationships where they can go to their local bank traditionally and get working capital loans. And so this is an opportunity to, again, not only think through just this pandemic, but look a little bit more holistically as to what it is you are trying to do to set your church up post pandemic. Um, the repayment terms are up to 30 years, typically for working capital loans, they have to, re have to be repaid over a short period of time. But what the SBA is attempting to do here is they recognize that whatever your operating expenses were before the pandemic, you're gonna have those same operating expenses after the pandemic, uh, except you would have this other expense of paying the debt service on this money that you're borrowing. So they're allowing you to amortize or pay it off over a longer period of time to keep those uh, debt service payments as low as possible uh, so that it doesn't hurt your cash flow. We obviously, you wanna keep in mind and that's why you should work with a financial professional, an advisor, or your accountant, or whomever, um, because the longer you stretch debt out, um, obviously that's the more interest you're gonna pay over the life of that loan. So you have to be cognizant of wanting to stretch it out long enough to where the payments don't hurt you from a cash flow standpoint, but not too long to where you're just paying more interest um, than you necessarily need to pay. The economic, uh, the idle loans, uh, a lot of people may have filled out sort of the blanket one page application online. And you may think that that's the, the end of the process or you did that in order to receive the, the $10,000 advance. Um, so that was just the beginning of what's really a bifurcated process. Um, that allowed determination of those people who were just in, uh, initially ineligible, I guess, to be weeded out. But there will be a request for additional information, right? So whether that's um, you know, returns, financial statements, 
uh, or what have you, p &L balance sheet um, for 2019, year to date 2020, because the idle loan is based on your ability to repay. So you have to be able to demonstrate what your income and expenses are in order for the SBA to determine how much you can actually afford, uh, afford to repay. So we're encouraging people to go ahead and gather that information because once you receive a request from information from the SBA, you have about seven days to turn that around. So you don't want to be in a position where you, you get that request for information and you're scurrying to try and gather all of the documents that you know, we're letting you know on the front end you're probably gonna need to have. Also, that's just gonna either decrease the probability of the loan being funded or delay the process and you actually getting the funds that you need desperately uh, to operate. Given that that time frame for idle may take a little bit longer, there is another bridge program uh, called the Express Bridge Loan. So if your financial institution, your bank, is currently designated as an SBA Express lender, you can get up to $25,000 unsecured uh, from that financial institution as a bridge loan to your idle loan. Um, once your idle loan is funded, the proceeds from that idle loan will be used to pay, pay off your bridge loan and then of course you would keep the difference. So in my earlier example, if you get $100,000, if you're set to get $100,000 idle, you can borrow 25,000 quickly through your bank as a bridge loan. And then when your idle loan is funded, 25,000 from that loan will be used to pay off the bridge loan. And this other 75,000 uh, know, would be uh, funds that you could use for operating purposes. So, it's really important to think about all of these products in concert because remember the PPP, that part's forgivable. So you wanna shift as much as you can onto that, your interest expense, your insurance premiums, you wanna max out that 25% uh, because that'll be forgiven. And then everything else you wanna put on the idle side because you will have to pay interest expense uh, you know, associated with, those, with, with that. Another thing, as you know, as churches in particular are seeing a decline in revenue from not being able to, to, to have worship service or not having the online capabilities, um, you know, is the thought of how do you utilize some of those funds to implement technology that may assist you uh, in not only being able to provide service, uh, you know, to your members, but also address those technology or infrastructure things that would allow um, individuals to continue to be able to give during this time as well. So that's something that we're definitely urging churches, um, you know, and nonprofits to consider. So with that, um, yeah, that is more of a, oh, actually, one other thing I wanna know is a lot of banks um, either have stopped taking applications for the PPP uh, or you're not seeing a fast turnaround. So I just wanna quickly address that because I'm sure people will have questions about that. Um, there was such a large influx of applications that large institutions such as Wells Fargo and some others didn't really foresee that coming. And there's only so much of the balance sheet that they wanna you know, put out for any one particular product. So they stopped taking applications or they only took applications from their members or customers. So there's a cap on these funds as actually mentioned. So we wanna make sure that one, you move expeditiously and two, quickly find out if your lender is still taking applications. And if not, you can go through the SBA, we maintain a list as well of institutions that are currently and actively participating in the PPP program. Um, so time is of the essence, that's why we wanna make sure we get this information out. But just as quickly as you receive it, uh, we hope that you act upon it uh, you know, while there is still allocation available. And, and with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Senator Melton. Great, thank you, Brandon, for uh, for giving us that presentation. Very quickly, I wanna just let folks know, I know you probably have folks reaching out to you that uh, they can't get into uh, this session. We have maxed out, so we apologize, but this will be recorded. We will make this available. We will send this to all the partners online. I try to make it available on social media as well. So let folks know we, we won't leave them behind that this information will get to them uh, if they can't make this live session. 
So at this time, what I want to do is just take a brief moment and acknowledge our partners and give them a moment opportunity. And I want to remind folks that are still on today that feel free to send, submit your questions in the chat. I know some are being answered as we speak, uh, but Brandon is here to answer those questions. And if it's something that uh, Brandon might not be able to answer, we'll get with Mr. Bell and get that to him as well. Um, so submit those questions. And if we have time later on, we will take live questions uh, at the end. So with that being said, uh, uh, since we missed you the first time, uh, Dr. McLeod uh, with the Urban League of Northwest Indiana, uh, do you have anything you wanna share with folks uh, on the line? And first of all, thank you for partnering with us today. Uh, thank you, Senator Melton. Can you hear me now? Yes. Perfect, perfect. Technology is something else. I'm still in kindergarten uh, <laughs> on this technology piece, but thank you for hosting this session and thank all the other partners for joining in. I'm especially glad to hear that this line is maxed out. That means that there are uh, many churches in our area that need these resources. So we're here to help. The Urban League office is closed to in person, but we are working remotely um, from from our um, homes and our cars. And now somebody is trying to call me and I'm trying to push this <laughs> button. So, but thank you all and I appreciate you. And if anyone has any additional questions, they can always reach us at 887-9621 um, just in case they can't get a hold of you. Senator Melton and Brandon, thank you for all of that information that you shared. Thanks again, Senator. All right, thank you so much. Uh, Kelly uh, with uh, Legacy Foundation, thank you for joining us today. You wanna share anything with the group? Yeah, absolutely, thank you for hosting. And um, it is great to see such a strong response to this webinar. I think it's important to understand for the nonprofits and the churches, um, that this SBA um, opportunity is also for them. So it's not just for small businesses. Um, you know, this is impacting everybody. It's impacting all the nonprofits, um, you know, residents, churches. And so this is something that is available for you. Um, and, uh, you know, if if you have employees, um, you should take advantage of this opportunity. Um, and so, uh, you know, have your have your bookkeeper, your accountant take a look at the application, contact your bank uh, at Legacy Foundation. We do have a um, opportunity available to help reimburse you for the cost of, uh, if you do need to hire somebody, a professional um, CPA or attorney to help fill out the application. And so you can go to www.legacyfdn.org to take a look at that application as well. All right, thank you so much, Kelly. Uh, Deanne with the Crossroads Chamber of Commerce, uh, thank you for joining us and being a partner today. Anything you wanna share from the your chamber's perspective? You're still on mute. <laughs> Thank you so much, Senator Melton, for having us today and allowing the chamber to be a part of this. It's great information for our nonprofit organizations and our um, faith-based um, members as well. So we truly appreciate you letting us join in and being able to supply this information to our members. Um, we do have a resource page on our website with several of these links that have been talked about today and a resource guide and how to fill out the information. So I encourage um, anyone to go take a look at that for some easy access and some quick um, click on links to get right to what you need. And we're here to help. And, um, you know, our nonprofits have reached out to us and we've been supplying a lot of information on how, you know, people can get things that, to them that they need. So we're happy to funnel all that information as well. If people just want to send us what they need, we're happy to send it out. Thanks again for having us. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, Andrew, with uh, Lake Area United Way, thank you so much for joining us. You guys have been a great partner. Uh, share a little bit from United Way's perspective. Well, thank you so much, Senator Melton, for inviting us to partner with you and to provide this uh, information and opportunity to our nonprofit and ministry partners. Um, I wanna just take a, a second to thank all of the folks that are on the line today, all of the nonprofits and pastors and um, lay folks that um, have been working so hard to take care of the most vulnerable 
in our community in Lake County. And so I just want to recognize them and affirm them uh, for that amazing work that they are doing. Um, uh, we uh, at United Way are always open to partnering with you and to helping you build your capacity uh, to do your work and to do your ministry. So uh, I want to just share with you one resource um, that is available for you uh, to promote uh, your services, uh, your ministry, um, but it's also good to share with people uh, in your family and with your coworkers who may be struggling. And this is an online resource directory. Uh, it's called uh, Resource Roundup, and you can find it at www.resourceroundup.com. And so it's a way for you to um, uh, share with your clients, share with your families, share with your staff, um, some of the many resources that are available right now. So thank you. All right, thank you so much. Um, as we tee up and get ready for some of the Q&A that's come through the chat, just wanna remind folks, stick with us a little while longer. If we have some time left, we'll take Q&A live um, after this session. So uh, I'll ask Brandon if he can join us and uh, see if we have any questions. Okay, thanks, Senator Mountain. Yeah, we actually have several questions. Uh, the first question is, can we detail the PPP again? Uh, so very quickly, uh, the PPP, the Payroll Protection Program, that is uh, a forgivable loan. Uh, up to $10 million, but it is based on your average monthly payroll, uh, and you can borrow up to 2.5 times your, whatever your average monthly payroll is. So if your average monthly payroll is $10,000, you're eligible for a loan uh, up to $25,000. And as long as you utilize at least 75% of the funds that you receive from that loan for payroll, uh, and you can prove that at the end, uh, then that loan will be forgiven. And if you don't, whatever you don't utilize for the proper purpose will convert to a loan that has to be repaid at 1% over a two year time period. Um, the next question is what paperwork is necessary in order to obtain the PPP loan? Um, each lender may require something a little different. Again, this is a lender driven program. And while there was a general application that the SBA put out, each lender is technically responsible uh, for reasonably being assured that the information provided warrants the loan. Uh, so they may ask for something a little different, but in general, uh, they would wanna see a payroll report um, or your quarterly payroll returns, you know, in order to justify it. And then if you are um, doing it as sort of a, a sole proprietor as the individual responsible for the entity, um, then they may want to actually just see the tax return in the event that you are not actually paying yourself uh, on a traditional payroll perspective, which is more, more so for the for-profits than the non-profits. Um, the next question um, is, is this webinar being recorded? Uh, great question. The webinar is being recorded uh, and we will provide the link to the webinar um, to Senator Melton, uh, who will pass it along to all of the participating organizations so they can share it with their memberships. And then I'm sure he'll actually also post it someplace else uh, just so uh, the general public can, can see it as well. Hey, Brandon, very quickly while you're getting the next question, I just if folks want to take the time and opportunity to follow my Facebook page, my state senator Eddie Melton Facebook page. Uh, we'll make sure all information is going to be there. And also want to say uh, any other important COVID-19 information moving forward regarding the state of Indiana and federally, I try to share that uh, as frequent as possible. So uh, just encouraging you all to follow our social media sites uh, today. Thanks. Okay. Um, the next question is, I have a small church with a small budget and I pay my staff through cash. Will I be able to apply for the payroll loan? I do have proof of payment. Um, so the method of payment is not the determinant factor, whether you write, write a check or you pay through cash. Um, you know, the question is whether or not you actually uh, you know, pay payroll taxes for those individuals. Um, 
And, and I would say that that's definitely a great question to kind of talk through one-on-one afterwards. I'd be happy to look more into detail uh, at your specific situation and tell you, you know, if you're actually eligible, because there's some additional questions that I would have to ask uh, beyond what's, what's stated here. Um, the next question, um, does your church have to be in distress to apply for a PPP? That, that's a phenomenal question. Uh, a lot of institutions uh, seem to be a little dissuaded from going after these loans because they, they feel that we are, we're doing well um, and this isn't for us. And, and that's, nothing could be further from the truth. Um, you don't have to actually be in real financial hardship to, to seek these funds because we're all impacted in some way. So as long as you have you meet the eligibility requirements and you have um, W-2 employees, you can verify the payroll. We want, the government wants to ensure that you keep these people working. Uh, and this is to help incentivize you to do that. So you don't have to prove uh, how economically impacted you are in order to be eligible to receive the PPP loan. Um, Hey, Brandy, can I just make a, a very quick comment there? Uh, I just want to express this sense of urgency of going through the process uh, because this is a national program, and I'm sure there are a lot of entities that's going to be applying. So from a, from a sense of going through the necessary steps and, uh, and processes, we want to make sure folks uh, move as quickly as possible. Yeah, and thank, thank you for echoing that. Um, the next question says that if I've already submitted a PPP application, but it has not been approved yet, are we possibly able to change the amount we are requesting? After listening to this, I believe I need to change the amount. Um, for that, you would need to check with your lender because that application would have gone through your lender um, and, and see where they are in the application process. I would certainly encourage you if you feel like you need to modify the amount to reach out to them, but that is going to be based on, um, you know, whether or not your lender will uh, modify that application. Uh, the next question, I have a small church with a small budget. Uh, okay, no, yeah, that's a repeat question. Um, let's see. Okay, oh yeah, Q&A, okay. I'm an advisor helping small business get help through the CARES Act. Bank volume is high. Most small businesses are being turned away by major banks and direct lenders. What can we do to help small businesses actually get help? Uh, Sam, that's a great question. Um, you're right, a, large, a lot of the larger institutions have already meet, reached their capacity on what they're willing to do through the program. So there are some uh, non-bank lenders um, who are participating in the program, as well as what I would call some underutilized lenders, meaning those banks uh, who have an appetite for this program that exceed their existing customer base, that we could certainly help put uh, people in, in contact with. And I believe the local SBA offices are also closely monitoring which banks in their respective jurisdictions are still actively lending in the program, so you can reach out to them as well. Um, the next question, uh, do we qualify for either a PPE or economic impact loan as a nonprofit who receives the majority of our income sources from state grants? That is a, that is a great question. Um, that is going to depend on who the payor of payroll taxes um, so if the grantor, if the funds flow through the grantor and somehow they're paying payroll taxes, um, then no, but if it's a flow of funds to you and you are actually making those payments, uh, yes. And, and that, there are also some other caveats to that. So I would definitely encourage you to reach out and we'll provide our information post this call, um, to discuss that in more detail. Um, the next question is, is the payroll for W-2 employees only or are 1099 contractors eligible as well? Uh, originally, the thought was that 1099 contractors could be included in an employer's PPP. 
Uh, however, um, now it's encouraged the 1099 contracts are eligible to apply for themselves. And therefore, uh, you as the employer would apply for your W-2 employees and allow the 1099 contractor uh, to apply for themselves. Um, the next question is, our organization does not have a large payroll, but we have a high utility bill. Uh, should we apply? Uh, I would. It's important here to remember that the amount of the loan you're eligible to receive is going to be based on the payroll. Um, so you can utilize, so it's two and a half times payroll, and then you can utilize 25% of that for your utility bill. Um, whether or not you have a large payroll, I would say it's probably in your best interest to apply if you have a payroll at all, right? I mean, these are funds that would be forgiven. And if you have the ability to demonstrate that, um, with it basically becoming a grant, I would encourage you to apply regardless of the size of the payroll. Um, the next question is, is contracted services such as lawn care, deep cleaning services considered for employee expenses for the PPP? Um, I would need to know a little bit more about how your organization is set up. So even though you are a contractor, yes, you are eligible. Um, and in fact, they've modified the guidance um, such that you could potentially do it based off of your tax return. And that's something you would have to work out how you document that with your lender. But the overall, the general answer would, would be yes. Um, let's see. The next question is, is there a grace period uh, before the government starts charging interest? Uh, for, yeah. Uh, so the answer there is also yes. Um, so for the PPP, in the event that it's not forgiven, uh, you can get a six month deferment uh, or apply for even longer if there is, um, you know, if you can prove an economic need. And then for on the idle, um, that actually, the clock doesn't actually start until one year after receipt of funds. Um, the next question. Okay, that's a repeat question. Oh, uh, it says that I mentioned additional documents that they may request it for an SBA relief loan. Where can we find that list of additional documents? So there is a list on the SBA site. Uh, we can get we can get the exact link, and then we also have a a deck or presentation um, that we can share with this group that also outlines the required or potentially required documentation for each loan product. Hey, hey Brandon, uh, very quickly, I wanted to, to, to say for folks that may have dialed in and didn't tune into their, uh, via their laptops, uh, if we save some time just for some live questions, just in case of those folks uh, don't have the ability to type in the chat. Okay. Okay. Um, the next question is technology enhancement. What, which program would that fit in? That would fit in the idle, idle program. Uh, the only non payroll expenses that can be utilized that the PPP can cover are interest expense on a mortgage or lease, uh, as well as insurance premiums and utilities. The next question is, are credit unions a part of these programs? Uh, if they're an SBA approved lender um, and, and you can go to a list of approved lenders, then they may be eligible. The question is whether or not they are participating. Um, so I would just say, I, I would reach out to that particular credit union you might be thinking of and see if they are actually, actually participating. Um, well, Senator Miles, I think it's 14 minutes left. We can, you uh, open it up for live questions now, or would you like to take a few more of the written questions? Uh, let's open up for live questions. Let's make sure folks, uh, if you're not speaking, remain on mute uh, so we can hear folks clearly. So let's open it up for the first person that may have a question. 
It looks like someone. Uh... Jacqueline is raising her hand. Okay, it looks like uh, Jacqueline is raising her hand. Uh, Jacqueline, you can go ahead. Yes, I have a 501c3, and all of my persons are independent contractors. Uh, so I am paying myself, however, on a 1099. Am I able to do that? Through the 1099, you can apply, just as the other people you're paying on 1099s can apply individually as the 1099 contract. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. Any other questions that uh, you want to ask? Are you anyone else? To, are you able to hear me? Uh, are you, are you Dr. Smith? How are you doing? All right. And then thank you for your services. Um, you, you partially answered my question. Um, I have two questions. One is, um, if we find out a year from now that only 500, maybe half of our granted monies are acceptable for waiving, at that point, can we pay the balance without penalty of interest? Yeah, there are no prepayment penalties. So if at the, the time you you receive determination that you actually will have a now loan at that point, you can pay at that point without the interest accruing. Okay. Because there are no prepayment penalties. Now, um, our, our payroll is very small at the Glenn Theater, uh, but the cost of operating that theater goes on. Uh, even though we not have any events. I understand through the PP pro program, because we, uh, our payroll is low, uh, most of our workers volunteer their services. And since they volunteer their service, that keeps our payroll low, but our utility bill is, it goes on and it's, it's enormous, enormous all year long. It gets worse in the winter time. Uh, mm -hmm. But, but my, my question is, should we go for the small business loan administration loan that will help us with the utilities because we've had to cancel all of our graduation uh, ceremonies that we had booked. We've had to cancel, cancel all of our uh, in-house productions and all the other rentals. And so we're losing money and we're still paying out and the insurance goes on, everything else goes on. What would be your suggestion for a, a, a situation like that? Uh, I would utilize both. I recognize that the payroll is small. I would still, you know, apply for the PPP and use 25% of whatever you get there to go towards the utility expense. And then for the remainder, I would apply through idle, um, you know, to get that additional portion covered. Because uh, again, nonprofits, the interest rate on that is only 2.75%. And they can be stretched out so that you it doesn't really create a cash flow burden and you don't have to start making payment for a year after you receive the funds okay so if i went to the sba site and i uh, applied is that the idle portion that would be the idle that would be the first step of the idle um and so again we would prompt you to make sure you have all of the financial information that, that they're going to ask for um, you know, your P&L, your balance sheet, everything showing your revenues and expenses because they're going to ask for that supporting uh, documentation. I completed the, the, the paperwork, uh, the applications for both uh, uh, loan programs. And I have heard from uh, First Midwest, uh, but I have not heard anything from the SBA. Uh, what's the timeline? So regional administrative bill uh, on the prior call gave an update on the timeline and you know, he said that obviously it just depends on when your application went in the queue uh, but folks should look to hear responses uh, beginning today uh, and through the rest of the week. Thank you. All right. Hey Brandon real quick there was a question that I've been receiving 
um, and I'm sure many folks have, barbers and beauticians, mm -hmm. uh, are they eligible for uh, this application process? Uh, yes, I mean, we've talked to a lot, I've talked with personally with a lot of barbers and beauticians. Uh, a lot of times they're set up as a, as a sole proprietorship um, and sole proprietors are, are eligible you know, to apply. So we would definitely encourage them you know, to seek uh, advice from someone, but definitely they, there's nothing that precludes them from being eligible. Okay. If there's no other live questions. If there are any more in the chat, we can go there. Um, then once we conclude with those questions, we can go ahead and, um, and share any closing remarks. So we'll, we'll start going to the next questions. Hello. Hey, Reverend Jackson, how you doing? Hey, I'm doing all right. Senator, how are you? Bless, bless. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. And I appreciate you and Brandon and everyone else. My question is, we've already uh, made the initial inquiry at a lending institution, and they are supposed to call us back to complete that process. It's taking, you know, a bit, uh, bit of time, and I'm wondering if I apply at another lending institution, not to, not to draw from both, but just to try to get a faster return, would that be held against us, or is that okay? Uh, that's a great question. A lot of um, a lot of people have made multiple applications. Uh, it's really based on the lender's requirement. Some lenders have requested uh, in their application, so you need to review uh, what's in your application. That if you apply through them, you can you will not or cannot apply through another lending institution. So I would, I would one look at what was stated in the application you filled out with that particular lender. Uh, but if not, we certainly know of many organizations, uh, you know, who made applications through a couple of different institutions just to see who would get it processed first. Okay, thank you for that. Yes, sir. All right. Anybody else on the line? Yeah. Okay. Um, Uh, one other question that came in via the Q&A is, are funds available for those trying to start a business during the, during the crisis, such as a staffing agency? Uh, and I, I will remind everyone that the date to remember is February the 15th of 2020. Uh, in order to be eligible for these funds, your organization would have had to be operational and in business on that date. Uh, let's see. Uh, the next question is, we are a nonprofit church which has provided ministry outreach uh, support services to our community since 2001 on a volunteer basis and provided rental space and all materials. Are we eligible to apply? Um, so, I guess the question would be one for the PPP is, do you actually have a payroll? Um, if you don't, or if you aren't paying individuals, then the answer would be uh, no. Um, and then on the idle side, the other thing to remember is it's based on your ability to repay. So I can't really glean it from the question, but the, uh, the, the thought there would be, do you have revenues coming in? Um, and, and if so, you know, what would you be able to repay based on your revenues versus expenses? And that's something that if you want to provide additional context, I'll be more than happy to, to discuss uh, post the call. Um, yeah, Laura Bates asks, as far as looking at loans in a holistic approach, any suggestions or questions for our organizations to review prior to, to applying? Uh, yes. Um, I think you want to ask yourself, one, first and foremost, what are all of our payroll costs uh, and how can we get as much as possible through the PPP program and maintain compliance to ensure that we pay people and meet the requirements? Um, how do we secondly max out the 25% that's allowable for these other charges? Because again, all of that will be forgivable. Uh, then on the third part, 
I would really take a look at what the church's trajectory was, uh, you know, sort of pre-pandemic, what your financial situation was, net income, um, and then think about where you believe you will be post-pandemic, because you want to make sure you have the ability to repay uh, whatever you borrow. This is still a loan uh, on the idle side. So, you know, I would say be cautious um, and use leverage smartly, but remember that this is an opportunity that a lot of churches, frankly, would not have uh, to just walk into a bank and receive a low interest loan for working capital. Um, so I would definitely be conscious of what you have the ability to repay, um, but not be fearful to the point where you don't secure the funds that you need to really make your success, uh, your church or your nonprofit successful post pandemic, keeping in mind what this has really shown us, which is that you need technology, you need to be able to reach members and people in a different way. So as you're thinking through your vision for your church and your organization, post pandemic, I would also look at this loan as an opportunity um, to help set you up for success going forward. And Brent, I have a, a question that was sent to me personally, uh, directly right now. Uh, this question that this person is a hair stylist that does a 1099. What if someone has applied for PUA as a 1099? What is the intersection between PPP and PUA? I'm not sure where PUA is. I'm, I'm not, I uh, yeah. need some additional. Uh, yeah, if, if that person is listening, if you got a little bit more context, send it to me later and, and we can try to connect you uh, with Brandon and, and try to get that question answered. So, okay. sorry about that, go ahead. Uh, no, and then I, I think uh, probably the uh, final question, uh, if you've cut your payroll to defer expenses at your church, can you still qualify for payment prior to the cuts and are you eligible to bring them back? That is uh, a phenomenal question uh, and Regional Administrator Bell answered this on the last call. Um, you know, if you had 15 employees uh, at February 15th and then you, you know, have let five go, for example, when you go to your lending institution for the PPP, uh, you really have that option of uh, do you want to apply for just the 10 that you currently have uh, or do you want to bring those employees back and utilize all 15 um, and it's tied to the positions and not necessarily the particular individuals uh, but the, the answer is yes um, you can take that average monthly payroll you know based on those 15 and then hire those five employees back or hire five more um, but the important thing to remember is you have to use those funds um, to pay those 15 employees over those eight weeks um, at that rate, or you can't reduce the rate more than 25% of what you're paying. And that's the final. Uh, well, we see more questions coming in, but I don't know how we are on time, Senator. Yeah, this is like we're approaching. Uh we actually just hit our mark for, for one hour and, and I have another call uh, set up. Uh, but so let me just pause and say thank you to everyone that has joined. Uh, we apologize for those that could not join us because we maxed out. Um, so make sure you inform your colleagues and friends and associates that this is recorded. We'll try to uh, share this on different platforms. We'll share it to the organizations that are partners today. We'll also share it on social media. If you feel so inclined, follow my Facebook page, which is State Senator Eddie Melton. I'll make sure we share that information in there as well. Um, any closing remarks, Brandon? And, and let me just thank you for your time and your expertise uh, in this. And being a native of Northwest Indiana, being a native of Gary, uh, and sharing your professional experience uh, is much appreciated. We appreciate. Uh, White House uh, advisor Ashley Bell for joining us earlier today on this call as well. So Brandon, any, any closing remarks? No, Senator, I would like to just thank you uh, for your leadership and being able to help provide this information uh, to my home region. Uh, I grew up at St. Timothy Community Church and so I want to see all the churches uh, and nonprofits in the, uh, in the region be successful. Uh, so our information is up on the screen and anyone or anything that we can do to be helpful, please consider us a resource. 
uh, and we'll be sure to make ourselves available. Uh, so thank you again, Senator, and, and to all of the other organizations who, who partner to make this possible. Absolutely. I want to just thank them again. I want to thank the Gary Chamber of Commerce, the Crossroads Chamber of Commerce, the Urban League of North Pacinianna, the Legacy Foundation, and Lake Area United Way. Thank you all so much for your partnership. Uh, and for those that have joined us, we continue to pray for you as you pray for us. And I know this is for our faith-based partners and small businesses, as well as the nonprofit organizations. Uh, this is an extremely difficult time. We understand that. I want to encourage you all to remain safe, encourage you all to stay home, and continue to practice those best practices of washing your hands and social distance uh, six feet between uh, individuals if you have to go out. So again, we thank you so much for your time. Any closing thoughts from our, our, our guest uh, uh, panel before we leave? None? All right. Thank well, you. All right. Thank, thank you. you all. Thank you all for joining us. All right. God bless. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.